Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. But we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com, and hit the Contact Us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. There is a clear and absolutely vital connection between our prayer lives and our experience of the peace of God. As we learned in a previous study, to experience this peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, we must follow, as we called it, God's pathway to peace, a pathway that Paul has carefully laid down before us. So let's quickly review what are the steps on the pathway to peace, and they're here in this passage. So in order for you and I to experience the peace of God, we must first, the first step is to be reconciled to one another. We can't be at odds with each other, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and expect to experience the peace of God. Second step is we must rejoice in the Lord, despite what is going on around us, despite the circumstances that are trying to rob us of our joy, we must remember to rejoice in the Lord because He is the source of our joy. So we are reconciled to one another, we rejoice in the Lord. The third step is we must be reasonable, Paul says, let your reasonableness be known to all men, what that really means is we must be gentle with one another. It means don't be so rigid in your preferences that you cause disunity. So that's the third step. Be reasonable with one another. The fourth step is we must relax and respond by not being anxious, by not spending our time in worry, and, but instead we spend our time in prayer. And what do we discover when we come to the end of God's pathway here? Well, we have this wonderful promise, a promise that has brought comfort to millions of God's people throughout the centuries. And it's in verse 7. Let's see it. Let's look at it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, we'll look at that in greater detail in a week or two. But there's the promise. If you follow the steps, this is where you end up. If you try and take a shortcut, if you try and make your own path, you won't experience the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. So because prayer is such a vital component for you and I to experience the peace of God, it is crucial that we possess an understanding of the kind of prayer that pleases God. Now, implied in my statement is that there is prayer that is not pleasing to God. And we know that to be true. So this morning, the focus is going to be on prayer. The Christian life begins with prayer. It continues throughout with prayer. And prayer is a vital component of our spiritual growth and development. And we all know by firsthand experience just how difficult prayer can be. i give you an example. I got up early this morning to pray. And I went to my office and sat down in my chair. Next thing you know, I wake up. I was so irritated. I didn't intend on going back to sleep. I just got out of bed for crying out loud. But somehow I fell asleep. It's difficult to pray at times, isn't it? So I, I, I understand that. I, hey, uh, I fight it too. And I doubt that very many Christians, if you ask them, if you took a poll, would say that they are satisfied with their prayer lives. Very few of us are. So it's my prayer that this will be an encouragement to you this morning to put, perhaps to look at your prayer life in a different way and perhaps put some more thought 
and energy into your daily times of prayer. So let me begin by giving you just three benefits of prayer. And there could be a whole lot more, but let me give you just three of them this morning. First of all, prayer is one of God's chosen means whereby we get to know him. It's just one of his chosen means. After all, remember this. Well, let me, let me put it this way. If I were to ask you, what is the goal of the gospel, what would you say? A lot of people, I'm afraid, would say, well, heaven. Heaven. No. The goal of the gospel is what? God. God. What did Jesus say about eternal life? He said, this is eternal life that they may know you. Who's he referring to there? To the Father. So uh, the goal of the gospel is to help us know God. So the Bible teaches that there are certain limited truths that we can learn about God through his creation. We can look at creation and deduce that God exists. We can look at creation and get a certain sense of the majesty of God. But we need to know so much more about God. Creation cannot teach us about the character of God. So therefore, God reveals himself, God reveals his character to us in the scriptures. It's in the scriptures that we learn the character of God. We learn that God is holy, that God is just, that God is loving, that God is kind, that God hates sin, and that God demands a righteousness that we simply do not possess. And the scriptures teach us that in an incredible act of mercy and grace, God provides the righteousness that he demands through the sinless life, the sacrificial death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that righteousness of Christ can become ours when we repent of our many offenses against God, which are sin, which is sin, and we believe in Christ as the only source of our redemption. So we learn all of that in the scriptures, we learn so much about the character of God in scripture. But we also learn, we also come to know God through prayer. We learn about God through the time we spend with him in prayer. Prayer is the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Prayer makes the difference in knowing about God and knowing God. Prayer helps us turn the knowledge of the scriptures into what? Experience. We can talk all we want about the peace of God. But just knowing about it does not benefit us, does it? The benefit of the peace of God, that knowledge needs to be coupled with experience in order for us to benefit from it. So prayer helps us take this knowledge that we have and turn it into experience. So let's look at this on a human level. How do... Uh, you and I get to know each other as human beings, as people. Well, we have to talk to one another, don't we? And the more that we talk with one another, the more we learn about each other. We get to know someone. You know, someone will say, hey, do you know so-and-so? And you might say, well, I know about them, but I don't really know them. What do you mean by that? Well, you know a little something about them, but you've never really sat down and talked with them to, to learn what they're like. It's, it's, it's kind of like reading a biography. You know, you can read a biography and learn about someone. I think I, I've read the majority of biographies uh, written about uh, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And because I've read so many biographies, I know a lot about the good doctor. But I would never say that I know Martin Lloyd-Jones. Number one, he died the year I got married. And number two, I never had a chance to talk to him personally. So I know about him but I don't know him. I do have his picture on my office wall, and when I get stumped every once in a while, I look at him and say, what would you do? Uh, he has yet to answer me, by the way, which is good. Uh, 
But see, you can, you can know about someone without really knowing them. You can know about God without really knowing him. And sadly, I, I think that describes the knowledge, the kind of knowledge many professing Christians have when it comes to God. They read about him in their Bibles, but they don't really pray in such a way that they come to know him. You know, it is, is, there are at least two ways to pray, even as Christians. As a Christian, you can pray in a very cold, impersonal way. You know, you, you can have it on your to-do list to pray today. And you just kind of do it to get it over with, to kind of salve your conscience. Well, I did pray today. Yeah, but there was no heart in it. There was no passion in it. There was no earnestness in it. You just prayed to get it done. That's kind of a cold, very impersonal way. Or you can pray in a very warm and personal and intimate way. And that's the kind of prayer that should characterize our lives as Christians. J.C. Ryle said, if we wish to be with him in heaven, with God, we must be friends with him on earth. So, first, to experience the peace of God, we must pray. And why do we pray? Number one, to know God. Number two, why pray? To experience assurance of salvation. To experience assurance of salvation. Prayer, let me, I always, I'm going to qualify this as much, many times as I remember it. Biblical prayer is a sign of spiritual life. And by biblical prayer, I mean the kind of prayer that we see in the scriptures. Lots of people say that they pray when in reality, all they are doing is talking and hoping. A lot of what people call prayer is nothing more than wishful thinking. Uh, many people pray expecting God to cater to their every whim even though their lives show no evidence of spiritual life. They have no desire for holiness. Seeking first the kingdom of God has never been their priority. And so they say things like, well, God, if you're up there, or God, if you're listening, or let me talk to the man upstairs, or some other irreverent way of addressing God. But the Christian, the man or the woman has been born again by the Spirit of God, knows that God is ruling and reigning on high. The one who has been granted spiritual life, the one who has been born again, knows that God exists. And that God that exists, he invites his children to come boldly into his presence, to come and talk with him at any time, at any place, to bring all their burdens, all their cares, all their sorrows, all their joys, and come and spend time with him. They know that they have been invited to come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy and help in the hour of their need. And how do they know this? They know this because they have been born again, because they have been given the gift of eternal spiritual life. They know that they are connected to the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we just had our eighth grandchild born, little Cooper. Now, I'm sure they don't do this nowadays. This would probably be considered barbaric, but when my kids were born, uh, you came out and you got a little whack. I'm sure nowadays you, you couldn't do that. But anyway, uh, why did they do that? They wanted to get that baby to what? To cry. To cry. Now, why do they want the baby to cry? Well, there are several reasons. One reason is they know they're alive, Right? That cry is a sign of life. Likewise, we as believers, prayer is a sign of life. When we cry out to our Heavenly Father, we know that we are what? We are spiritually alive. The preachers like to say that appetite is a sign of life. Well, a sign of spiritual life is an appetite for prayer. And the more that we pray, the greater our assurance of salvation grows. As we feed our appetite for prayer, the more we desire to pray, the more we desire to pray, we are assured of our relationship with the Father. Little prayer, little assurance. Little prayer, little relationship. Just how it operates. And again, I want, I want to make something abundantly clear here. I'm not talking about prayers of duty. There are plenty of people who pray prayers out of duty. And perhaps they feel that it's their duty to pray so that they can earn some kind of favor with God. Everyone involved in a false religion prays out of a sense of what? Duty. They think if I pray enough, if I do this good work enough, that will somehow earn me favor with God. 
God is not honored by prayers of duty. God is honored by prayers of intimacy. The one who prays may be a very dutiful prayer, but there's no intimacy there. They are not prayers that come from a heart that has been born again. So to experience the peace of God, we have to pray. And why do we pray to know God? Why do we pray to experience assurance of salvation? And thirdly, why pray to experience growth and holiness and boldness? To experience growth and holiness and boldness. Think about the great saints of the Bible. Uh, One of my favorites is Daniel. Daniel is known for a lot of things, isn't he? Daniel is known for his uh, his, uh, strength and his courage in the face of adversity and intimidation. And we know he spent the night in the lion's den. We know that much about Daniel. But what else do we know about Daniel? Daniel was a man of prayer. How did Daniel get into trouble? By praying. They make a law. You can't pray to anybody else but our king. Daniel ignores it, rightly so. And he continues his practice of getting on his knees before the God of Israel three times a day, knowing full well the consequences that would come to him because of that. His prayer was an act of obedience. Can I say that again? His prayer was an act of obedience. I'll say it a third time. His prayer was an act of obedience. Increased obedience leads to increasing holiness and boldness. Where do you think the strength and the courage that Daniel demonstrated came from? How could he face the lion's den with such courage? You know, there is absolutely no hint in the book of Daniel that as they led him to the mouth of the lion's den, that they led him kicking and screaming. There's actually no hint in the book of Daniel that he pled for his life, that he pled for mercy. There's no mention of him going weak in his knees and fainting in fear. And so we ask, how can a man face such a torturous death with such peace and courage? You know how? His peace and courage came from a lifetime spent on his knees getting to know the God of Israel. And you say, well, what does any of this have to do with holiness? Well, a holy man is a man who knows God, who knows the character of God. The Christian is a man who knows that the cherubim described God as what? Holy, holy. Holy. Therefore, the more that we pray, therefore, the more that we spend time in the presence of God, the greater will be our desire for holiness. Here is a truism of the Christian life. Truth does one or t- one of two things always. Truth always attracts or repels. Mark it down. Therefore, God is truth. He's the source of truth. And that truth will always attract those who have been born again by the word of truth. Again, let me quote J.C. Ryle. He said, praying and sinning will never live together in the same heart. Prayer will choke sin or sin will choke prayer. A praying Christian knows the reality of 1 John 4, verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, here's what that means for us as believers. We have nothing to fear from the world. Nothing to fear from the world. Has the church as a whole acted that way in the past 15 months? A praying Christian is a holy Christian. The Christian also knows that the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are, what's it say there? Say, I remember meek is a lion. Bold is a lion. Have you ever met a meek lion? 
the cowardly lion in the Wizard of Oz wasn't real, by the way. Okay. Lions are bold. They're big. They're bad. They're called what? The king of the jungle. The righteous are bold as a lion. A praying Christian is a holy Christian. A holy Christian is a bold Christian. Those are just some thoughts on why we should pray, some benefits of prayer. Now, let me give you some thoughts as to why we pray. We need to understand why we pray. And I, I, I'm not looking to offend anybody, but I want you to consider this. Have you graduated from the preschool of prayer to a secondary or graduate level? Say, so what do you mean? Well, you know, the kind of prayers that are said by rote memory. You know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's the level that a lot of Christians pray on. Do you think that accomplishes much? That that pleases God? So ask yourself, what level am I at? And the great thing is there's always room to move to the next level. Let me give you, I believe I got three things here about how we should pray. Number one, we should pray with reverence and humility. We should pray with reverence and humility. Now, right off the bat, we, we face an issue. And the issue is this. We live in the age of what? Casualness. Casualness. We have convinced ourselves that appearances don't really matter to God. God doesn't care what you wear to church and so forth. I'm not here to debate that with you this morning. But a casual attitude carries a hidden danger. Say, how so? The hidden danger is that our casualness begins to creep into our worship, into our service, and our attitude towards spiritual growth. You know, when you think about this, you, you can't square that kind of attitude with what Paul has been saying to the church at Philippi. He says, I press on. I'm straining forward. He's the picture there is running the race, giving all the energy that he has, exerting himself to the fullest. Is there anything casual about that? Have you ever seen a casual Olympic sprinter? Get there when I get there. No. No. I think it'd be helpful for us to take just a few moments this morning to go back through some of the scriptures and see how God's people address them in prayer. In fact, I would challenge you to try, try and find even one example in the scriptures where God has, has been approached by his people without reverence and humility. And there are a lot of prayers in the Bible. Let me give you three examples this morning. First one is Hannah. If you want to flip to 1 Samuel chapter 2, you can. If not, I'll read it to you. So who was Hannah? Hannah was the mother of Samuel. She was a godly woman, but she was pretty much an ordinary woman. We would all identify with her. But she prayed this way, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now, notice there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. And then she says, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. That's, there's something that we need to pay attention to. Or how about the prayer of Hezekiah? I'll just read this one for you in 2 Kings 19. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, now notice this, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Or how about the prayer of Daniel? And this is early on in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel answered and said, now he's not praying yet, but notice how he approaches prayer. He says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. 
He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with them. He, he's preaching to them, listen, what's about to happen here is, has nothing to do with me. This is from God. So now he prays, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made me know, have made known to me what we ask of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. Now, I'm sorry, we could look at a dozen other prayers, but those are just three examples. I do not see any casual attitude any an over familiar approach to prayer in any of those prayers not one well let me give you one this is how to seal the deal how did jesus teach us to pray well in matthew chapter 6 pray then now this is jesus pray then like this our father in heaven hallowed be your name he didn't say come any old way that you want. He didn't say come and be flippant and irreverent as you approach God. God is not your bro. God is not your dude. God is your maker. God is your sovereign. God is your creator. You are, as Jonathan Edwards said, a spider hanging by a thread in God's hands, and you are over the pit of hell, and if God chooses to let go of that thread, you will perish eternally. And you want to deal with him like he's your bro? He's some dude? He's not your surfing buddy? And perhaps part of the weakness in our prayer lives is the fact that we do not approach a holy, righteous God with reverence and humility. Second, we should pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We should pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I wish I, wish I had been taught this 40 years ago. There is never a connection made for me between prayer and the Holy Spirit. Never. But I think the Bible is clear that the kind of prayer that pleases God is Holy Spirit empowered prayer. Let me let's talk about it for a moment. You might remember in Ephesians 6:18, Paul said, praying at all times in the Spirit. Now, what is that passage a part of? The armor of God. So, in order for us to be fully protected, we must do what? We must pray when, at all times, how, in the Spirit. So, let me ask you a, qu a question. Has God given you, if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, has God given you his spirit to help you in every area of your life? Now think it through. Has God given you his Holy Spirit to help you in every area of your life? I don't see how you could say no, but you may, but you would be wrong. Because he has given us his spirit to help us in every area of life. So therefore, we would have to conclude that every area of life includes what? Our prayer lives. As we are filled, say, what's it mean to pray in the spirit? As we are filled with the spirit, we will pray in the spirit. Now, here's the sad truth. There's so much confusion and outright ignorance about what it means to be filled in the Spirit. I'm afraid many Christians, well-intentioned, think that they're praying in the Spirit, think that they're filled with the Spirit, when in reality, they're not. Or maybe they've never even been taught about the necessity and the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's something for the Charismatics. That's something for the Pentecostals. That's not for us Reformed folk. It is. It's for all of us. It's for every Christian. So let me briefly review what it means to be filled by the, with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit, in the most simple terms, means that you are under the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And His control and influence in our lives is revealed in our obedience to Scripture. I've preached on this several times. You can go find them on YouTube. 
let me ask you a question. Do you consciously say to the Holy Spirit, I yield my will to you, and I place myself under your control. Do you ever say that? I try and say that every day, sometimes multiple times during the day. Why? Because I have to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Now, do you think that being filled with the Spirit, being under the control of the Spirit, includes our prayer life? Do you think that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that He exerts His influence on our prayer lives? Of course He does. Now, let me give you some references and tie this all together. The first one is Romans 8, 27. Paul says, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit does what? Intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now let's connect another dot. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now let's think this through. Do you think the Holy Spirit knows the Father's will? And I'm not trying to be funny or stupid or irreverent. Do you think the Holy Spirit knows what the Father's will is? Yes, he does. So, we also know that the key to an effective prayer life is to pray God's will. Only those prayers that are prayed according to the Father's will will be answered. Listen, you can plead, you can beg, you can do whatever you want, but if it is not prayed according to God's will, he is not going to answer that prayer. Well, he'll answer, but it'll be no. So are we all on the same page, hopefully, at this point? So if the effectiveness of our prayer lives depends upon praying in accord with God's will, and if the Holy Spirit knows the Father's will, then as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, as we pray in the Spirit, as Paul says in Ephesians, we can be sure that everything that the Holy Spirit leads us to pray is what? Is prayed according to God's will. Can you see this? These are not separate pieces. These are pieces of a whole. Therefore, to pray without submitting and yielding and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit without obedience to the Scriptures, your prayers will be in vain because you'll be praying according to your will and not God's will. The Holy Spirit is always ready to help us as we pray. Do you even consider that? When we are not sure how to pray... And when we are not sure what to pray, what should we do? We should seek the filling of the Spirit. Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Again, when we're not sure how to pray or what to pray, we can be confident that as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He will give us the words to say if we will only ask. He will supply the thoughts that will shape our words. Every time you pray, please seek the aid of the Holy Spirit. And as we pray, our prayer brings new and continual outpourings of influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, uh, you know, we, we have to consider this. Who was it that began the work of grace in you? It was the Holy Spirit. And who continues that work of grace in you? It is the Holy Spirit. Third thing. We should pray specifically. I, I appreciate John's prayer this morning because he specifically confessed sins. And I'm afraid that's a missing element in many of our prayers. If, you, if I were to ask you to do a little experiment, here's the experiment. For the next week, if I were to ask you to record your prayers... And then at the end of the week, I, I would ask you to sit down and analyze those prayers. And here's what I want you to look for. Did you pray in a very general way or did you pray in a very specific way? See, when God invites us to the throne of grace, he invites us to come with something specific in mind. Have you ever talked to someone and you kind of got the impression they really didn't have anything important to talk about? Yeah, it happens all the time, doesn't it? 
If you're impatient like me, you probably say, is there something you want to talk about? And I wonder sometimes we approach God if God's not waiting for us to say, or he wants to say to us, do you have anything specific you want to talk about? For instance, how many times have you heard someone pray something like this? Lord, lead, guide, and direct. Lord, lead, guide, and direct. Lord, lead, guide, and direct. Have you heard anybody pray something like that? They pray the same phrase over and over and over again. You say, is it wrong to pray that way? Well, it's not necessarily wrong to pray that way, but that's a very general prayer. And so my question would be, what do you want the Lord to lead, guide, and direct you in? What is it that you're specifically dealing with or facing that you need his leadership, his guidance, and his direction in? Be specific. For instance, when you confess sin, do you confess them specifically? Granted, nobody likes to hear exactly how they've sinned against God. You know why? We realize just how ugly and sinful we are. Just how vile and wretched we can be. When we hear in our own words saying to God, God, I did this. We don't like that. We shouldn't like that. So you know what our fallback position is to kind of soften the blow? We are more than happy to say something like, uh, Father, you know I'm a sinner. And you know that I sinned today. Or, Father, you know that I broke one of your laws. That's kind of general, isn't it? We never specifically deal with that sin. But how about this? What if we go to God and say, Father, I sinned against you when I gossiped to my wife about Mr. Jones. See, that's specific. And that reminds me that I need God's grace to deal with the sin of gossip in my life. I've got to go to the doctor this week, and you who know me know I would, I'd rather be beaten like a mule than go to the doctor. And I'm not particularly looking forward to it this time because I've, I've gained some weight. And doctors can be very unkind at times, you know, and say, hey, Chubbs, what's going on? You know? So, you know, I look at that and I say, you know what? If I've, if I've put on some weight, I probably didn't exercise self-control. And if I didn't exercise self-control, I probably wasn't filled with the Spirit. You know, going to Culver's three times a week to get the fish sandwich is probably not helpful. Right? What does the Bible call the sin of overeating? Does it call it indulging yourself? Rewarding yourself? Calls it gluttony, does it? Say, Father, I confess I'm a glutton. Do we ever go to God and say, Father, I didn't exercise self-control again, which is the fruit of the Spirit. I watched six episodes of The Office back to back to back when I had more important other things to do. Father, I could have used that time to memorize Scripture, read my Bible. I could have used some of that time to pray. Father, forgive me for not being filled with the Spirit. You say, well, how do you know you're not filled with the Spirit? Because I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit would not lead you to watch six hours of The Office in one afternoon. I'm pretty confident of that. See, that's being specific. Now, that's from a negative point of view. Let's look at it from a positive point of view. We should ask for grace in our pursuit of holiness. We should ask for grace in our pursuit of Christ's likeness. We should ask for grace in overcoming temptations. And perhaps the temptation is to spend six hours one afternoon binge watching The Office. And you say, Father, please help me to be a better steward of my time. Do you think that is a, a plea, a prayer request that he would honor? Of course he would. 
Perhaps you struggle, as we all do, with our tongues from time to time. So when you pray, you get specific about that. You say, Father, I know that I can have a sharp tongue. I know that my words can hurt my wife and my children. So please help me to have control over my tongue today. Is that a specific prayer directed towards a specific problem? Is God concerned about how you use your tongue? Absolutely, he is. Do you think that is a prayer that is prayed according to his will? Absolutely, it is. Do you think that he would help you to control your tongue? Absolutely, he will. Now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing what? I'm seeing real results in my prayer life. So if God can help me with my tongue, then God can help me with my eating, or God can help me with my attitude, or God can help me with my temper. God can help me in all these other areas of my life if I will only be specifically praying about them. But so many times, you know, we're kind of like to self-help people, just make me a better person. God wants to make you a better person. God wants to make you like Christ, but you got to get down in the trenches and you got to do the hard work. You've got to press on. You've got to be straining forward. You've got to buffet that body. See? Pray specifically. But how about this? How about when we're facing times of trouble, times of discouragement? Some problem arises in our life. Do you tell God specifically what you are facing, what you're dealing with? Do you tell God specifically what your source of discouragement is? Well, let me ask you, what do we see in Scripture? Do we see those in Scripture telling God exactly what the problem is and exactly what they need and exactly what He wants them to do? We do. Now, take your Bibles, please, and go to Genesis chapter 32. And we're going to read a prayer of Jacob as he was going to be confronted or confronting his brother Esau. Now, if you know the story, there was bad blood. There was family feud that had gone on for a long time. They had parted ways. They had parted company. But now they were about to meet up, and Jacob is afraid that Esau is going to seek revenge. So let's read Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me. Now, notice this. He's reminding God of what God had said to him. What did God say to him? Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. Okay, he reminds God, now listen, God, the reason that I'm going back here, the reason I'm going to come face to face with Esau is because you told me to. Now, we know that Jacob was pretty much a trickster, but here in this instance, he was doing what God wanted him to do. So Jacob says, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. He's being honest, for only with my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. He's saying, God, you have blessed me tremendously. I can't believe how you've blessed me. Now notice what he says. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother. Is he being specific? What is he asking for? He's asking for deliverance. Who is he asking for deliverance from? His brother. But he gets even more specific than that. From the hand of Esau. Esau's his brother. Why? Why do I ask for you to deliver me? For I fear him. Well, in what way do you fear him, Jacob, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children? But you said, it's kind of like a sandwich prayer. He he's puts God's word on each end of it. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That is a prayer that deals with, it's crazy how much he deals with specifics in that prayer. He didn't leave anything to chance, did he? He knew why he was doing what he was doing. He knew what he was going to be confronted with. He knew what his fear was. He knew that he needed help. He knew that he wanted God to deliver him, and he asked God to do what? Deliver me. And again, he says, look, I'm doing, God, what you asked me to do. That is very specific. Say, so should we pray that way? Yes, we should. We should. When we are facing times of discouragement and trouble, tell God exactly what it is that is bothering us. Perhaps we don't experience the peace of God because we are so vague, we are so general, we are so afraid of pouring our heart out to God that we never get to the specifics of the thing. 
Now, what about Paul? Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and what, what did he ask God to do? Well, 2 Corinthians 12, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Say, well, this is a, this is a bad example. Were you asleep at a switch when you used this one? No. I understand that God did not answer him the way that Paul wanted him to answer, but God did answer him in the way that was what was best. What did he say? Now, listen, Paul, I know what you want, but my grace is sufficient for you. But don't miss the point. Paul was very specific. What was the problem? I've got this thorn in the flesh. He was very specific as he what as what he wanted God to do. What did he want God to do? Take it away from me. Okay. So again, we see another example of where a child of God has a problem. He takes it to God and he's very specific about it. So I wonder, if you were to examine your prayer life, do you pray in a very specific way or is it just some generic way? Have you fallen into the trap where you say the same things, the same words, the same phrases, time after time after time? You could repeat them from memory. You probably are. That's not the kind of prayer that pleases God. That's not the kind of prayer that brings us the peace of God. We need to learn to pray specifically. And By the way, let me say this. There's nothing too small for you to bring to God's attention. The temptation is, well, yeah, I know I'll bring the big things to God, but we don't bring the little things to God. Well, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Amen. As a parent, there is nothing ever too small for my children to come to me with. Nothing. It's the same with God. There's nothing too small for us to go to Him with. So learn to pray humbly and reverently. Learn to pray in the power of the Spirit, and learn to pray specifically. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Now mark this, guards will guard. A guard keeps things in, and a guard keeps things out will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 